Hello everyone and welcome to Sweating the Small Stuff, a show where we sweat over the details that make our world richer. I'm your personal brain trainer, Cameron Buzar Jamari, and today I am joined by an extremely special guest from the Retrospectives podcast. Would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you so much for having me here today. My name is Patrick Arthur, and yes, I'm the host of a retro, the Retrospectives podcast where we examine classic games through a modern lens. And today, the small stuff that I'd like to sweat is on the horrible, terrible, bad boss plans that exist in video games. And this, I gotta say, I'm actually really excited for this. I ran across your podcast online, and I, I felt very, very... I can't tell this is the word linked. I don't know. Just because it felt like we both come in at the same idea, the same kind of lens from different angles. We on Swaying the Small Stuff, we always spend our time looking at movies and TV, thinking of all the weird ways that those ideas don't make any freaking sense or what happens when you really look at them with science and with the real implications of the world applied to them. And on your show, you put such a beautiful emphasis and research into video games and all the yeah. like l- like all those beautiful little details from like my favorite games from the olden days like Ape Escape or Banjo Kazooie and uh so excited to have you here. Yeah, I'm I'm thrilled to be here. And the thing about video games is that they make even less sense than some of these movies um, <laughs> and TV series. Because, you know, uh, the things that you're mechanically doing in a game very often have nothing to do with uh, actually solving the problem. And uh, I think that the uh, the obvious place to start, for me at least, is uh, Banjo-Kazooie, which was one of the earlier games we reviewed. Uh, you, you've played Banjo-Kazooie, right? Oh, yeah. That was one of my all-time favorites when I was younger. Yeah, see, I was, um, I was a lot lower on it than my co-host, and uh, one of the reasons for it, and this is me obviously getting caught up in these small details, is how disconnected what you're doing in the actual game is from the overall objective of the game. In Banjo-Kazooie, you play as Banjo, and uh, you've got Kazooie helping you, hurt you, and you need to rescue your sister Tootie from an evil witch called Gruntilda. But what you're actually doing in that game you know, it doesn't have a whole lot to do with rescuing someone. Exactly, and I thought that this would be a fantastic opportunity to introduce what today's topic is going to be about, which is basically the mismanagement and poor planning that it seems to go on in most video games when bosses decide the convoluted way they're going to try and stop you from getting to your objective. Yeah, I, w- I wonder if it has something to do with the fact that, you know, these bosses, they have almost unlimited power. So, you know, instead of having to answer to committees... Uh, they can just do whatever they want. I mean, if someone disagrees with you and you can turn them into, you know, a, a puff of dust, well, they're not going to disagree with you. So your megalomaniacal plans can get out of hand real quick. Exactly. It's not like they have a board of trustees that they have to go to and Grenhill does be like, all right, I need more funding for my beauty zapping <laughs> machine. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, with Banjo-Kazooie in particular, um, you're traveling around Gruntilda's lair, but instead of it being, you know, just an endless sea of lava or patrolled by hundreds of high-level monsters, instead you're going inside portraits and collecting jigsaw pieces and picking up notes. And as I was playing through Banjo-Kazooie, as fun as it was to explore the worlds, I I kept stopping myself and going, what the hell am I doing here? Like, aren't I meant to be rescuing my sister? (laughs) Yeah, there's like, because at like one point you're in Clinker's Cavern, and then another point you're like on a beach, and then another point you're in like a haunted mansion, and it's just like so many scene changes the whole time you're thinking like, the amount of planning that must have gone into putting these things in place, she probably could have just gone ahead and done the stuff. Exactly, yeah, I mean, what... She, she had to put together a beach place. She had to put together in a, a mechanical uh, a mechanical beast to dispose of her garbage mm-hmm. and hide jigsaw pieces inside them. It, yeah, it, it, it's kind of like gotten out of control. Surely there would have been should have been a simpler way of dealing with it. But, you know, Gruntilda's crazy. Now, one thing I do want to point out is that when you have an organization as large as most villains and most video games with so many subordinates and henchmen, I wonder if any of them want to take artistic license. Like, maybe each one of the bosses, those quote-unquote bosses you end up with, get some artistic license with how their house looks. So, Gruntilda is subcontracting to each uh, to each boss monster. Yeah, the, uh, oh goodness, what was that, um, the Hermit Crab and the Beach Battle, that guy. Why can't I ever remember any of their names? 
Yeah, there, um, there's the hermit crab who um, you have to defeat, then you go inside his shell. And there's also the giant crate monster, which is actually mm-hmm. just a really big crate. So Yes. And that, well, that that's like the Amazon... Uh, that's like the Amazon warehouse box. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you what, there are a lot of crates in that level and uh, a lot of sludge as well, which uh, fits mm-hmm. quite well with uh, Amazon's treatment of its employees. So I think Oof. you've uh, hit the nail on the head there. We've gotten we've gotten a little off track, but yeah, I love <laughs> so I love this. So yeah, I think um, that is an excellent point to kind of start the conversation, which is when you're like I get from the developer side that you want to make something where there's obviously challenges and things in the way, but I think you have some great examples coming up for us on either how convoluted the plan is for the end game or how those plans don't make a lot of sense in terms of what their overall objective is that you're trying to stop them or beat them to or whatever in the game. Yeah, the, and there are different levels of um, of abstraction. And I think that Banjo-Kazooie is one of those games that's incredibly abstract. There are other games where it's a lot less abstract, but where the purported go- goal of these organizations seems uh, absolutely ridiculous. It's It's hard to even wrap your head around what they're trying to do. So I wanted, if if we're able, to move on to um, Team Rocket from the Pokemon games. Yeah. Uh, specifically Team Magma and Aqua from the third installment in the series. So in uh, te- in the th- in these games, there are two two factions depending on which version of them you got. So Team Magma's plan, and this is a plan by a very competent organization, is they want to detonate a volcano. So there's more land for people to live on. Uh, And in order to do that, they steal rocket fuel from a space station and are planning to dump that rocket fuel inside the volcano. (laughs) That's There there must be Pokemon that would be easier to make a volcano erupt more easily than stealing rocket fuel. Yeah, it's um, it's it's a little convoluted. Also, I'm not sure they understand what happens when a massive volcano explodes. So there's there's some scientific issues there. Yeah, because like just because you, oh, well, first of all, just because you blow up a volcano doesn't mean you made it active. So if they go to some dormant volcano and just throw junk into it, there's not a high pro- probability that like that's going to result in it becoming active and creating lava flow. So I, hang on, I want to jump out here real fast and just give some quick science. So for anyone who doesn't know, volcanoes are basically the product of enough magma buildup at the surface where the surface is thin enough that that magma can actually spew out. And as that magma spews out and cools and spews out and cools, it creates a, a volcano, basically a mountain that has shafts in it where magma is escaping and becoming lava. And... The thing here is if enough magma cools and the Earth's crust thickens enough, you're going to need to, a lot of effort to be able to blow up that mountain and get the magma to start flowing again to create your fictional islands. And so in this case, they would need to find volcanoes that are specifically tuned for this that aren't already spewing lava. Because if they're already spewing lava, it doesn't actually make a lot of sense for them to do that because it's not like a super fast process. It's... Lava is going to, or magma is going to come out at whatever rate it's going to come out there. Yeah, the person who's throwing rocket fuel into the volcano might experience, um, you know, being turned into a crisp. Exactly. But it's not going to generate <laughs> kilometers and kilometers of land mass. At least <laughs> so not instantaneously. It, it, yeah, so theoretically, Team Magma are doing this because they want um, more land for humanity. But I think that it's going to be doing a lot more damage to humanity than uh, than helping them out. Exactly, and that's so. To the flip side of that, the the team that makes even less sense. Would you like to introduce us to them? <laughs> yeah. So the other side is Team Aqua, and their plan's a lot more vague. But they want to create a lot of ocean. They think there's way too much land. They want everything to go underwater, and their primary justification for it in the original game is that all life came from the sea. Therefore, we should return to the sea. That, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that's like that one girl when you're near Cinnabar Island and they're like, there's like, not even just one girl, there's like the whole group of people that seem to spend all their time just in the water. Yeah, that's that's Team Aqua in a nutshell. And uh, it's almost cultish how, the, how all of the people in this place believe that this is the most logical course forwards. Yeah, and just to give a little more context for people, in the Pokemon games, uh, when you're traveling around, at some point you have to start surfing to Cinnabar Island so you can get the Cinnabar Island badge. And 
on the way there because we can't just let you go there. We have to put a bunch of random people in the water who are just swimming around so that you have to fight them. But the implication here is that these people have decided that they do not want to live on land anymore. And they love the ocean so much that they're going to just be there all the time. Which That's their home. It doesn't matter how many hours you're playing, they're just hanging there, swinging, swimming back and forwards. Exactly. And like, yeah, I get that they're supposed to be there, but like, where, where do they sleep? Do they just yeah. drown? T- Team Aqua obviously got all their recruits from, uh, from <laughs> Cinnabar <laughs> Island. Exactly. And yeah, it's, this, I don't actually, like this one that makes even less sense. Like, all right, I could see wanting to build land in your convoluted scheme to, I guess, put up more <laughs> apartment buildings, but trying to flood the earth like there's there are two different weird things going on first of all human beings barely cover i think 10 percent of all land on earth and i really got to dig up this quote so there's first of all plenty of land for us to enjoy even in the pokemon universe which is like loosely based like every single region is supposed to be loosely based on like hawaii and london and New York City, and different parts of Japan. So there's no logical reason why there's suddenly not enough land for people to live on. Yeah, and it's particularly notable because uh, Emerald uh, is, and you know, this this series, there's more water in it than any any others. Like you do a lot of uh, traveling in the water. So uh, yeah, not the not the best sense. I will say that they get a further justification in the um, in the remakes. And uh, it's only slightly better. Um, they want to destroy humanity. They're like, <laughs> humans Humans have spread too far, so we need to get rid of them because Pokemon are the greatest. So they turn into extremist uh, ex- extremist greens after after all that. So I'm not, I'm not sure that that's that much of an improvement. And that's, that's kind of like the big thing here is that... The, why did you like have this thinly veiled guise over exactly how much of what you're trying to do is it, it's just so convoluted and i almost respect it because i've seen enough <laughs> different projects and ideas get to that point where you started with something maybe not even good like you had that one guy who had a mission and he was very vague about it so everyone signed on and then now you are going to destroy the earth to for whatever reason in your version of the apocalypse and at that point it's just too late to argue yeah i I wonder how many people in the organization actually know the overall goal they're just like man i really like swimming and that's the extent of their interest in team aqua and then they suddenly discover that they want to destroy the earth and like wait a second (laughs) yeah that's and oh i found the article so according to the science daily.com mm-hmm Urbanization, 95% of the world's population, lives on 10% of all the land on the Earth. So that's easily close to 7 billion people live on 10% of the land. We can get a few more people there. And if I understand this correctly, that is supposed to be within close proximity. It says lives within 48 hours of a large city. So even remote isn't like nearly as remote as what the other 90% of the earth is apparently. So we have plenty to work with. Team Magma's got a really bad argument going on there. Both of them have bad arguments. I mean, it it seems so strange to make the, I guess, uh, ethical justification for your entire organization be landmass or the ocean. Yes. I mean, it's nothing living. It's just literally the dirt or the water. And, and, And that's the entire thing underpinning these organizations. So... Yeah, not not going to hold up under under much scrutiny, unfortunately. Now, if I recall, you have some other examples of how these boss battles, these uh, people higher up in their organizations, have maybe different or better approaches to how they handle you as the quote unquote hero of the game. Yeah, the, this is something that once again is a mechanical gameplay thing, but doesn't actually make any sense, and uh, and that's the. You often face multi-stage boss fights or you face weaker versions of enemies or enemies not going all out immediately against you. They gradually build up their power level, so the challenge gradually rises. And this is something we see in um, in in shows like Dragon Ball Z as well. Mm-hmm. But it always irritated me because if the enemy actually is actually taking me seriously as a foe, surely they would immediately go to their most powerful phase and try and kill me straight away 
rather than gradually powering up as they get weaker and weaker. Now, I want I want some examples because I feel like in some of those cases you're totally right. Like, why did you start off as a fluff ball and now you are a massive dragon? If you just started with a massive dragon, it wouldn't be even like no one. It wouldn't be like now this is your final form. It'd be like I wouldn't fight a massive dragon. I just wouldn't do it. I wouldn't feel the motivation. I would have that tinge of fear as I went into that situation. But- so the best example I think is um, is Dark Souls, and as a mm-hmm. video game reviewer, I'm obliged to mention Dark Souls in every single episode of podcasts I go to. So this is a perfect opportunity to do so. Um, for example, uh, one of the bosses you fight right in the la- latter stages of Dark Souls Three is called uh, Sister Frida. She's a she's a scythe wielding woman who's trying to protect her world. And it's a three-stage boss fight, three stages, where the final stage is her being some unreal, un, you know, she's powered by dark, her scythe attacks become increasingly deadly, but she has to gradually move through these stages to actually reach the end. Just immediately start, try, try and kill me, you're trying to protect your world, why, why are you going easy on me to begin with? Exactly. And uh, the same is true of uh, the more recently released Sekiro, where um, you fight enemies often with two to three stages, getting stronger as time goes on. Yeah, I would argue that there is a... Like, I understand that there's a mechanical element going on here, which is, as a video game, you don't want to just, like, ah, this is the big boss fight, and it's over. Good job. No, you don't want to just give them the one boss fight and have it be sort of epic. You want that crescendo but i think the fact that you built in this crescendo actually introduces a second opportunity that most of us like most of us always want to lead with our best foot forward but when you're trying to create a situation where you don't want people to fully appreciate the kind of ball game they've just entered in depend like an example of this might be like you're in the workplace or you're kind of building your organization mm-hmm. you don't want to just let everyone know how you operate you want to give you want to kind of keep some of your secrets close to your chest. So in a lot of these games, the implication is less that I'm just going to run up to this dude and we're going to have it out. And now it's eight stages later. I'm like, what did I get myself into? It's kind of like this is the current level at which like they are supposed to be super scary. And now there's even more stuff like you. You want them to feel daunted. Like I realize in a video game, you feel extra super powerful because you are this hero who has grinded got all this gear and now you're going to kick their butts but when you're an actual like in the real world you don't want to lead with your best stuff if you can afford to keep those trump cards for later because then everyone knows how you operate and they can plan for it you want to conceal your full strength you want to have trump cards yeah and that does make sense i guess the thing is when it comes to a matter of life and death uh, maybe maybe go for the uh, easy knockout blow rather than risking your life. But I guess in the corporate world, it often feels like a matter of life and death. Yeah. And actually, to your point about knockout blows, I think you had a really good example from Undertale you mentioned earlier. Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, one of my favorite ways that this idea is subverted is um, the Sands fight in Undertale. Uh, he starts off by saying, this is such a beautiful day. Everything seems idyllic and fine. You're getting ready for the boss fight to start gradually ramping up before mm-hmm. he immediately hits you with his strongest attack <laughs> right from the very beginning. And yeah. if you survive that first attack, whoa, I imagine it would be something like 1% of the population that survives it because you do not see it coming at all. And it's just a massive hit. It's just a massive hit. Yeah, he uh, he like is slamming you all over the world before you're even remotely ready for a boss fight, and it's uh, it's very well done, and it shows the power of what you could get away with if you could attack with full strength from uh, from the get go. So there are definitely situations where you want to be careful, but if you're fighting for your life, you can and you, you can get them unexpected and kill them before they get a chance. That makes sense to me. That's what I think the villain should do. And I want to specifically call it Undertale. It's one of my favorite games just because it's, first of all, it's a game that actually subverts all your expectations. So for anyone who hasn't played Undertale, the plot is you've fallen into this underworld where basically all the monsters that we've ever heard of supposedly exist in some form or another. But they're not like monsters like we understand them. They're basically just people. And I'm going to give you a bit of a spoiler, but the game's been out long enough that I feel I can get away with this. 
you're not supposed to actually kill anyone. You're supposed to show them compassion and mercy. And specifically, mercy is supposed to be how you end the fights. Is you, if you kill them, you're actually doing yourself a disservice because by the time you get to the end of the game, you are going to get dunked on so hard based on how much you have harmed people up until this point. And I think it's an interesting metaphor for life, which is if you can show people more compassion, then you're like you actually like if you beat the entire game without ever killing anyone if i recall sans just lets you like he's like what's up get out of here yeah the um undertale is brilliant i mean the actual game is is wonderful not just in the messages it tells but in how playful it is with all of these mechanics and how it like you said it tricks you the um you're meant to show mercy to enemies and be kind to them and laugh mm-hmm. at enemies' bad jokes mm-hmm. to defeat them. And take them to spaghetti dinner. <laughs> Instead of stabbing them with a knife. Yeah, and then that's... What I love about this, though, is it's also because it loves to take those subversions of expectations, it takes that to the extreme when you do have to fight. So exactly in this final fight, you spend most of the game running into this guy. He's basically a skeleton who likes to tell bad pun jokes. His name's com or his name's Sans because I'm pretty sure it's just like a play on the fact that it's Comic Sans. Yeah, and he's he's literally my favorite. I think he's most people's favorite thing about the game, especially because even his battle music is just exceptional. Oh man, the music is so good in that game. But what really just drives it home is that his fight is completely dependent on all the actions you've taken thus far, and because of the way you've interacted with him so far. You do not expect any part of this, which is genius. It kind of goes back to that point we are just talking about, which is you don't want to reveal all your cards up front. Like, you might figure out in some way or another that Sans is a particularly powerful guy, especially because he's always hanging out with Papyrus, and Papyrus's fights were also pretty exhausting, in my opinion. So, when you get to that fight, you might have some inkling of how much power he has, but because he spent so much time subverting your expectations, it builds into that... I was not expecting any part of this, and that is the beauty of his strategy. Yeah, he's um he's pretty much a, a goofball, but but maybe you're right. Maybe the fight against Sans starts when you when you first meet him and start speaking with him, and he doesn't mm-hmm. reveal his stuff in the fight until the very end. So yeah, maybe my complaint about multi stage boss fights isn't as uh, robust as I initially thought. You've made some good points. Well, I think it's just going back to the long con is you put these dominoes in place and then at the perfect time you want to find one to knock them down and this is the perfect example of that now mm-hmm. i don't want to spend too much time focused on this because as much fun i know i could talk about undertale all day but i think <laughs> you too. still had i think you still had a few more examples under your belt that you wanted to walk us through yeah so this is another one that um that happens a lot in movies and tv shows but um once again it was a particularly terrible one from another game we played recently called f-zero gx So Mm -hmm. F-Zero GX is a racing game, and um, at one point you get captured by the villain, Black Shadow. So Mm -hmm. he's got you completely at his mercy. He can do whatever he wants you. He can shoot you in the head. Instead, what he does is he puts you in your car. He gives you your car, and he puts a bomb on your car that will make the car explode if it goes below a certain speed. Mm-hmm. From the fame, like in the famous movie, the bus that wouldn't slow down or speed for people who don't watch <laughs> The Simpsons. Yes. Um, and he put, starts your car off at, you know, 800 kilometers an hour. So you're above it. And then he leaves you to, to your devices to see if you can keep your car above that speed. And the whole time I'm watching this cut scene, completely confused out of my brain, not understanding <laughs> why he engaged on this elaborate scheme <laughs> to put a bomb on your car that only explodes under very specific circumstances instead of just killing you. And so I think one of the funniest things about that example is it kind of goes back to all those convoluted, I am a supervillain, and now I'm going to strap James Bond to the table and put a laser beam on him, and eventually the laser beam will probably cut him in half, but I've given him like years of time to get out of the situation. And like just like this, like... I love that. It's like, first of all, the speed mechanic. Like, I wait, which one came out first? I'm pretty sure the movie speed came out before that game, the, right? The movie speed came out long before this game. This game right. is like two, 2002 or something. So, yeah, they, they just ripped off the movie speed. A little bit of cribbing happened. but A little bit. <laughs> what I particularly enjoy about this scenario is, like, first of all, 800 kilometers per hour is 
very, very fast. Yeah, you like, go fast in F-Zero, very mm -hmm. fast. At least the, car, the car's moving insane speeds. That's like the main selling point of the game. And then on top of that, you have this this convolution of putting a bomb... Like, the, surely there's a way for... Actually, I think one of the things I like about this is like, if this were the movie speed, you could have pulled a truck up along the side, the race car or whatever, just like they do in speed, and you just hop on the bus and the thing just goes and explodes and it's whatever. Mm hmm but because you're going 800 kilometers per hour, you're actually kind of trapped in the situation. So I admire the planning on their part because it cannot be easy to coordinate putting two vehicles close to each other at 800 kilometers per hour. There's no margin for error there. Yeah, you are, you are forced to... And I mean, the gameplay mechanic is you have to go through this um, incredibly long track that has a lot of hairpin turns in it and a lot of civilian traffic. And if mm -hmm. you bump into one of these cars, well, you're going to slow down a lot and you're, you know, you're... Uh, your race is going to explode. But, you know, it does beg the question, why not just detonate a bomb? Or, you know, shoot them in the head. Or, you know, any one of these things. The, the, these villains aren't the, uh, aren't the smartest, is what I'm trying to get at. Actually, I want to say, I think this villain might have, and by extension, you may have introduced us to the best possible outcome from this situation, which is when they inevitably make the F-Zero movie, because they will, Keanu Reeves can play Captain Falcon. <laughs> Genius. I love it. We've got it all figured We've out. We've done it. Okay, let's go get this million dollar idea done. <laughs> we can stop making Just podcasts completely now. rip it off. You're right. We, we've got it all figured out. It's the sequel. And, you know, Keanu Reeves is doing well. The guy's yes. guy doing good. He can, he I, can be an action hero. I think there's like a bunch of images of like some guy from like the 1600s that looks exactly like Keanu Reeves. So it's believed he's an immortal of some sort. As From what I've seen, he is a mortal. I, I think that they could make another Matrix movie today and no one would even notice. Exactly. And, oh man. So, I, okay, sorry we got super off topic there. So were there any other examples of kind of like that convolution going so, on? So the other one that stands out to me is um, in the original Half-Life game, uh, mm -hmm. Half-Life 1. This was released in 1996. Um, the, we, we once again have another ripoff of a property where you get captured by a couple of the Marines finally. Mm -hmm. And instead of killing you, that they they their their stated goal at this stage is to kill you, Gordon Freeman. But mm -hmm. they instead throw you in a trash compactor, which uh, has trash in a uh, almost a staircase leading out of the trash compactor. That's very convenient. <laughs> yeah. So once again, ripping off Star Wars in this in this instance. I, well, first of all, I want to give a quick shout out because yes, Half Life especially Half-Life 2, was one of my favorite games from back when I used to be a more active video gamer. Mm -hmm. And so I do particularly enjoy the plot and the overall sci-fi mechanics of that game, especially the Gravity Gun was my favorite things. Gravity Gun is brilliant, yeah. But yeah, this kind of goes back to that continuing thing, which is just when you're creating... Like, I, th I don't even want to like... I don't even want to downplay it though, because like the Marines probably had a lot on their plate, and they're like, maybe we could save some bullets and just throw this <laughs> yeah, guy. yeah, M maybe that's it. They're just trying to be conserved with that ammo. But the thing is, in the F Zero example, it's a racing game. They're going to kill you in something that's you know related to racing. I can I can almost buy that thematically. In yeah. Half Life One, it's a game where the whole point is you're trying to shoot them and they're trying to shoot you. Yeah. So then they capture you and then they don't shoot you. They put you in a trash compactor. So it's a, it's a little on the nose. And then think of the, well, think of the bigger picture of like who you who's caught you. So like in F zero, you're caught by the quote unquote big bad. So, yeah. Just about, I think, I think there's one guy in the hierarchy above him, but he, he is one of the big bads. Yeah. And there must've been an exceptional amount of planning that goes into building a bomb that will be attached to your speedometer <laughs> that will know exactly when you go underneath a certain speed. There, yeah, someone, was, was, someone was engineering that one for a long time. Yeah. I, I bet you that wasn't even the plan. I bet you he was going to just kill them, but like someone in R and D is like, we have this bomb and we like never use it. <laughs> it's been, it's been sitting here for months. Can we please <laughs> use this bomb? We have to justify it. And then on the other hand, you have Half-Life, which is like, I'm sure most of these Marines don't get paid to think about how they're going to dispose of Gordon Freeman. They're probably just like, this is just another thing we have to do today. So we'll just put them over here. They'll probably be fine. It'll do the job. And it is true. This is in the midst of an alien invasion. So perhaps they got some, uh, 
feeling of solidarity from that fellow man and wanted to uh wanted to not not they didn't feel like shooting another human being in the head at this point yeah and i oh i should probably take a second to just clarify in case anyone's confused at this point f-zero is a classic racing game where you are in these kind of like think something with pod racers but instead of jet engines strapped to them randomly they're just the like pod and you're driving along and you're going super fast and it's awesome if you've ever and, played Pod Racer 64, it's it's a similar sort of idea. Yeah. And then Half-Life is the plot that they're you work at this super secret research facility and they open a wormhole that introduces this completely alien presence that's trying to take over the Earth. And obviously you, being a good person who doesn't want the Earth to be taken over, would like to stop that. Yeah, you're you're a nuclear physicist, so therefore you're the obviously the most trained person to go murdering hundreds of people and aliens. Yeah, because everyone knows in nuclear physics class, the first thing they do is hand you a gun. They hand you a crowbar at the very least, and they tell you to get yes. whacking. I, I actually believe that. I have no reason not to believe that a nuclear <laughs> power plant operator doesn't bust into the reactor all the time. Hey, you, um, you got You got to know how to use a crowbar if you're a nuclear physicist. Yeah. So before we wrap up, I just wanted to say. I just want to wrap up on these two guys, which is to say uh, I love both examples because I think the first one where it's Black Shadow in F-Zero, there is always kind of like when you're in a big organization, there is that mild amount of bureaucracy where like your potentially not convoluted plan becomes convoluted because so many hands are in the pie. Mm-hmm, that's it. Exactly. Yeah. You, you have um, you have a really basic idea and then all of a sudden you've got 30 people in the room adding their bits and pieces, and it gets a little out of hand. Exactly. And then the flip side of that is going to be when you are on so many different projects, when you're a smaller guy or a team of smaller people who has to do so many different things, that the tasks that seem like they are not going to be as potentially important in the grand scheme of what your op- what your objective is are easier to kind of brush aside, which I appreciate in Half-Life because... This is a big example of, like, if you had just taken the time to take care of that, you wouldn't have died later. Yeah, if you, if you want to take out the trash uh, and you, you, you're, you're at the bottom of the chain, sometimes you're gonna, not going to be bothered taking out the trash. So I think this has been a phenomenal and just overall entertaining conversation about all the different ways that video games can teach us things about kind of scope creep, this idea that you start with a good idea and as more hands get in the pie, things get messed up. Or having a very vague vision in the beginning and having that vision in Team Magma and Aqua's case come to be a not very good actual plan. And we've, I'm sure people can think of examples of any of these where you, you're you trying to debate which foot to put forward. Do I want to put play all my cards at once? Or do I want to give a little bit of time to see how that plays out? And I think in a weird way, if you really want to dig into them like we love to, video games and movies but in this case, particularly video games, have a lot to teach us about your corporate strategy. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Play lots of video games and you will succeed in the corporate world. Exactly. And so to wrap this up, I think it would be a great time for you to go ahead and plug all your stuff. Oh, if- thank you very much. So uh, we, the name of our podcast is the Retrospectives Podcast. Uh, you can send us an email at www.retrospectivespodcast at gmail.com or you can follow us on Twitter at, at @retpodcast. That's at R E T podcast. We basically do reviews of games that are in the I you know 90s, early 2000s, that sort of area, and we go very very deep and do a deep dive review to see if they're worth playing today. I'd like to thank you once again for having me on. It was a lot of fun. Um, I do love complaining about and nitpicking <laughs> video games. So any opportunity I get to do so is very much appreciated. And thank you so much, Pat, for coming on my show. This has been an absolute delight. And yes, I'm a big fan of your show and look forward to all the fantastic things that you guys keep putting out. And as for us at Swing the Small Stuff, you can find us online at smallstuff.show or you can find us on social media at Small Stuff Show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and we even have a Patreon now. So if you feel like you really love the show and want to give us a little uh, moolah, we would really appreciate it. And if you're really liking the show, please do share it with a friend. Leave a review on iTunes, like anything that lets us know that you're out there enjoying what we make. And if you want to get in touch about the small stuff you're sweating, 
You can reach out on uh, smallstuffshow at gmail.com or on Twitter with hashtag smallstuffshow. And I'm your personal brain trainer, Cameron Boozer Jamari, reminding you from movies to media to the world around us, it's details like these that make it worth sweating the small stuff. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, no, I thought that went really well.